like I said, I believe we could have a bottom in the market, but I don't believe that we have the bottom in the market. And one of the reasons for that, aside from the usual indicators not showing up, such as oil bottoming before the market, the VIX making kind of a panic spike, there's just amongst the indexes and the sectors, they don't seem to be moving in tandem. They seem to be all over the place. To me, that represents somewhat of a schizophrenic marketplace, a lot of indecision, a lot of money just moving around to various places, and a lot of trading going on. In order to have a market, you need investing. You need people who are coming in and buying and holding and really supporting the market. This is purely a trader's market right now. And some of the things I'll point to, take the S&P 500, for example, which was up you know, a modest half percent today, okay? But then you have the Dow, which was only up two-tenths of a percent, okay? Meanwhile, you have the mid-cap 400, which was up a much stronger 1.2%, as well as the Russell 2000, which was up a much stronger 1.2% as well. Then you have XLF, the financial sector, up 1.6%. Meanwhile, consumer discretionary, a, another leader of sorts, is only up half a percent. XLK, technology, only up half a percent. Oil, pretty flat on the day. Okay? So, the analogy I've used before is when the general falls, the soldiers don't know where to turn. Okay? The market has lost its general. Technology and financials were the clear leader of the rally in, at the beginning of the year. They have obviously faltered by a lot over the last couple months. And so the generals went down, and now the soldiers, the other pieces in the marketplace, are looking for a sense of direction. And they aren't getting that direction. For instance, you're seeing a stock like Apple hold up relatively well. Okay, it, it held this low here from last week. Apple and what would you guys say was one of the other major technology leaders to start the year? What were some of the other high-flying tech names? I know there's one that comes to my mind right away. Exactly, Priceline, that's the one I was going to say right away. Google was not a leader. Google was actually flat on the year. But so you have a stock like Apple, but then meanwhile, you've got a stock like Priceline, which went below its most recent lows. Okay, so before where you had Apple and Priceline, you know, both, you had Apple and Priceline really have a nice correlation here all the way through April up to their highs. Now what you're seeing is Apple is starting to outperform Priceline. So, you know, Using that analogy, Priceline was a general, but it has fallen. Okay, so now we need a new general to replace it, or we need it to find its ground. You had another stock, for instance, Salesforce.com. Great leader in, in the technology space for a, long uh, for a long time of this year. However, this one has also fallen below its lows from last week. Okay, LinkedIn as well. Great move through May 1st, but again, it's fallen below its lows. Then in the consumer discretionary space, okay, you've got a stock like Nike, which has been a good, a good solid leader, but now again, you look and it has fallen below its recent lows and is, you know, below some key support levels. Versus is a stock like Under Armour, which is well within all-time highs. Lululemon, Again, not too far from all-time highs. Whole Foods, not too far from all-time highs. Chipotle, off of its all-time highs, but it did put in a higher low versus its most recent low. So we're just seeing a lot of, a lot of mismatching going on in the market. And bottoms typically form when you have all of these leaders bottoming together. Okay? So part of my strategy moving forward is to short the stocks that look weak, okay? 
by looking weak, I mean, have they gone below their most recent low, like Nike, like Salesforce, like JP Morgan, like Goldman Sachs, okay? And go long on the stocks that look strong using their most recent, recent strength as a stop loss. For instance, Bank of America is, to me, representative of a great risk reward scenario here because you've got this low at 672. And here we are, we put in a higher low at 685 yesterday. So you can trade against that 672 low. Uh, excuse me, you can, you can use yesterday's low of 685 as kind of a stop loss point. And you're only talking about a stop loss that's 3.5% away. Meanwhile, if this turns out to be the bottom for a stock like Bank of America, your reward is, <coughs> your potential reward is, is really quite nice, you know, if it bounces up here. You know, Apple, same thing. You're here at 562. Yesterday's low of 548.50. Okay, you're talking about a stop loss that's 2.5% away. Meanwhile, if Apple can get back towards above this high and then target these highs here at 610, you know, that's a great, that's a great uh, risk reward there. Chipotle, same thing. You've got yesterday's low at 387.87. And here we are at 401, so we are 3.5% away. Meanwhile, if it can break these highs and then get back towards its all-time highs, you'd be looking at gains of 10%. In the options market, that again translates to a good risk-reward scenario. So just because the market is on shaky ground right now doesn't mean there aren't stocks that are maybe trying to tell you something about their underlying strength. The fact that they were able to hold a low while the market was not tells you a couple things when it comes to supply and demand. Number one, it tells you the market is finding more, uh, it's not, there are, there is not as much supply in these names at these levels as there is relative to the overall market. Okay? So that's good. And you want to tread in those types of stocks. That's where you want to hide out in. Now, the danger for the market, of course, is now if these stocks break below these recent lows, now instead of them being buffers of sorts, now they become catalysts to further downside in the overall market. So one of my signals to, to really lean in on the short side in the S&P 500 will be if I see Apple break below yesterday's low, if I see Bank of America below yesterday's low. If I see Lululemon below yesterday's low, if I see Whole Foods below yesterday's low, okay? We already know what stocks are weak. That's obvious. Pick it out of a hat. You've got Caterpillar, looks like a piece of crap, okay? You've got something like Nucor isn't doing well at all. ExxonMobil looks like a piece of crap. Chevron, you know, just draw a rabbit out of a hat and, and it looks pretty bad. That's not what you should focus on. What you should focus on is where the strength is because when these strong stocks give up that strength, to me, that would be a very, very bearish sign and could serve as a catalyst for further downside in the overall market. So overall, my thesis would be you could have a tradable bottom here, but because of the mismatching nature that I've just talked about in the market. It doesn't look like the bottom. We don't have everybody on the same page. We've got some people going east, some people going west, others are going north, others are going south, and we're all trying to get to the same destination. We're not all going to end up there, okay? Bottoms are formed when everybody is going in the same direction, and that's coming off of an emphatic, you know, an emphatic move um, higher. For instance, if you look back to October when the market did indeed bottom and you see you know a stock like Apple from 354 up to 422 the next week you know a stock like Freeport McMoran from 3 from 28 up to 35 a stock like Caterpillar from 67 up to 84 the next week okay Bank of America took a little longer But J.P. Morgan from 27 up to 33 the next week. These were emphatic bounces, okay? These were various sectors 
all making emphatic bounces XLF from 1095 to 1234, XLY from 33 up to 37. XLK from 22 up to 2260 up to 2455. The industrial sector from 2760 up to 3070. Materials from 2777 up to 32. These were bounces in these sectors <clears throat> that were showing up in these stocks that were happening at the same time. Okay? And we're not getting that right now. We're not seeing this type of action even after this 10% decline in the market. So that's why I do not believe the overall market bottom from this move lower off of 1422 is in place. <clears throat> okay. So first question is in regards to a watch list and how to develop one because this person sees it as a critical step towards trading independence and I would agree 100% with that. Now, the first step with this is always going to be about your scanner. Okay, this starts with having a good scanner that returns stocks for you to comb through. Then from there, it's all about your criteria. Okay, now, this is the video that talks about how to set up your scanner, or excuse me, how I set up my scanner and talks about some of the examples on how to set yours up. And then it's all about what your criteria is. Are you looking for liquidity? Are you looking for volume out of nowhere? Are you looking for a stock that's breaking resistance? Are you looking for a stock that's approaching support, etc. Okay. Personally, uh, a good specialty of mine, something I have a lot of success with, is volume out of nowhere. Okay, that's how I picked up on stocks such as AGRT. Just recently was this day here okay this volume out of nowhere on that Friday and then you can see it got promoted GWBU you know this again volume out of nowhere trading activity out of nowhere on that day and obviously now it's awesome penny stocks pick Bowflex from way back here again was this volume out of nowhere okay now again my my scanner has gotten me into trouble because I've also had a stock like RARS that I've bought because of volume out of nowhere and obviously you know that didn't go well but I've had much more many more picks that have done well such as LUXR again volume out of nowhere STVF volume out of nowhere Okay, so I just showed you five positives that all went up 100% versus the one negative that went lower. Now, again, that's my strategy. That, that has worked for me, focusing on stocks that come up on my scanner. Okay, so they show up on my scanner. I type them into the chart, and I see what's going on. Okay, and then I will type, I'll, I'll write them down in my notebook. Some of the other tactics is you need to, you need to constantly be refreshing. Okay, so for instance... Last week, about a week ago, I, I put together a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine stocks, no, 10 stocks that had showed up on my watch list from my, uh, that I put on my watch list from my scanner. These stocks were VNGE, COIL, PHOT, LVWD, AECP, AGRT, SOUP, LUDG, MMAX. Okay, now it's been a week. So now I, I refreshed that today and I narrowed down the list. Okay, where now it only contains, of that original list, it contains LVWD, COIL, AGRT, AECP, okay? And the reason is, is because these stocks all remain 
above support levels to me. The charts haven't broken down and there is still some liquidity going on. Okay, something like PHOT that was on my watch list last week, well, you know, it, it's just gotten dumped and it's tanked and the liquidity's dried up. MMAX was one that was on my watch list because of this spike, but there hasn't been anything since. You know, so I'll, I'll keep it in the back of my mind, but I'm not really actively watching it. So the first step is, like I said, a good scanner, getting acquainted with your scanner so that it gives you some returns to comb through. The second step is, you know, what are you going to look for? Like I said, for me, I have good success with picking up on stocks with volume out of nowhere. Some of you might only be good at stocks that are breaking resistance. Some of you might only be good on stocks that have a lot of liquidity. Okay, GBG is a good one that I know some people in chat have been playing. Good liquidity last few days. GV, this is a stock that broke resistance yesterday, okay? You got to toggle around with the price criteria and whatnot. I just showed you one of the ways to formulate a watch list on the big board market. Big board market. Look at stocks that have stayed above their most recent lows relative to the S&P 500 or the broader market. You know, Whole Foods, Lululemon, Under Armour, Apple, CMG, Starbucks, Bank of America. Those are seven stocks that I have written down that I realized today they have all stayed above their most recent lows. Now for me, you know, it just comes from understanding what some of the high flying momentum stocks have been because I have more experience being around the market. But again, a lot of this watch list stuff is going to come from just that. You know, being around the market. Remember what we've talked about as far as the market is your friend. The more you get to know your friends, the more you know what they like, what they don't like, where they like to go out to eat, where they like to shop, okay? The market is one of my best friends. I know that this strategy is very useful for me, so I'm going to use it. Trading about trading using that most recent low as a stop loss when it's put in a higher low relative to the market. I also know that, you know, using the recent low breakdown on a stock like Priceline is a good strategy because I've gotten to know the market. And I also know that Priceline and Salesforce have been, you know, high flying momentum stocks. For a long time the last couple years at least so you know I didn't really look for these stocks per se they just kind of I just check on them frequently I strongly recommend this is more this is only applicable to big board traders not penny traders because penny traders it's just all about which stocks being heavily promoted and you know at that time but big board traders I strongly recommend picking five to 15 stocks and just making them your best friends. The less you focus on, the easier it will be because you will master those specific stocks. Sure, you're gonna miss out on opportunities in you know particular sectors that you don't focus on. For instance, I never trade the energy sector. I never trade Exxon Mobil. I never trade the industrial space. Okay, and so I miss out on good down moves like on Exxon. I miss out on good moves down in Caterpillar because I don't trade that space. And the reason I don't trade that space is because I'm not familiar with it. But I'm very, very good at trading Apple. Okay, I'm, I'm very good at trading Google and Amazon. Okay, I know what I'm good at. I know which sectors I have good success playing. And again, that also stems back to printing out your trades at, uh, during the weekend, seeing which stocks you tend to make more money on, which stocks are you losing money on. You might find that every time you try and play a bank stock, you lose money. You might find that every time you play a consumer discretionary stock, you make money. So what do you think you should do? You should say to hell with the bank stock and just focus on the consumer stock. One of the biggest mistakes I see traders make and athletes and just you know, people in general, is 
they focus on improving their weaknesses. This is a big mistake in my opinion. Screw your weaknesses. Forget about them. Just ignore them. Focus on your strengths. Okay? It's much easier to get better at something you're already good at than it is to get less worse at something you're already bad at. Okay? So one of the quotes I have written down is if you forget your weaknesses and only remember your strengths, eventually you will be strong. And that's something that was very hard for me and it's very hard in general as a trader because you want to master everything. You want to be an accomplished trader. But the key is in understanding that at the end of the day, it's about making good trades, okay? And if your weaknesses that you're constantly trying to improve on and you struggle with them, you're just gonna get frustrated. So next question, it is referring to ASYI, okay? And it just wants to know what's going on with, you know, where all this dilution is coming from. And can I try to explain, you know, on a stock that has so much, sell, so much volume for several weeks, where all the shares keep coming from to push it down? So this is stock specific, but it's a great question because it talks about some of the simple, some of the basic research that you should do before you just blindly buy a stock based on a chart. So first of all, if you look at ASYI, you can see that just horrendous, okay? And we know that there's a ton of dilution because this volume is, <coughs> excuse me, this volume is massively greater than any prior volume before, so we know it's not just bag holders, okay? Now, the thing you need to remember in penny stocks is you have no idea where the shares are coming from. Are they free trading? Are they preferred shares that convert into common shares at a favorable ratio to the preferred note holder? Okay, because in many cases, companies give shares to people, be it financiers, promoters, consultants themselves, etc. at very favorable terms which give them the ability to literally crush the stock into oblivion and still be making money even at a price of triple zero seven. Okay, like on ASYI's case. You have to, you have to at least understand the basics of reading a company's quarterly report which is called a 10Q. That's where you'll find your answers. Okay, the best website for this for penny stocks is otcmarkets.com. And in that 10Q, what I recommend focusing on is the accumulated deficit, notes payable, and other liability items. That will tell you how much dilution there potentially is. So if we look at ASYI very quickly, the first thing, okay, so here you want to look at the balance sheet. Before you even do that, the first thing you want to notice is how many shares are there outstanding. 533 million shares outstanding. That's on the very first page at the bottom. It's on the very first page at the bottom of every company, uh, of every quarterly report. Now, 530, 553 million shares outstanding. Do we believe that that's a lot of shares or not a lot of shares outstanding? Yes, I agree. That is a lot. That is way, way, way too many shares outstanding. I, just in general, from a promoter's perspective, I never would take a deal that had more than 100 to 150 million shares outstanding. That's just terrible, okay? And judging by the chart, it's got to be way higher now. So that's the first red flag on ASYI. Large outstanding share count. Now, Secondly, if you look at this deficit accumulated during the development stage, $68 million 
That is a ton. That's a huge deficit. That money has to be paid back at some point. I mean, now, for a penny stock that has no revenues and no product or anything like that, what's the easiest way to pay that money back to the people they owe it to? Yes, with stock, by giving them shares, okay? Now, then, secondly, not only do we have common shares here, here's something I noticed. I noticed that at March 31st, 2012, there were 263 million shares, and at December 31st, 2011, there was 166 million shares. So the shares being, being, the shares outstanding are on the rise. They are increasing year over year. They have increased, and now they have increased them again, as we just showed with the 553 million shares. To make matters worse, you have preferred shares. Series B, common, uh, Series B preferred shares, 2 million outstanding. Series C preferred shares, okay? So preferred shares, you just, you want to be very, very careful. Now, the other thing I said to focus on is notes payable. Notes payable will tell you how much money do they owe because we know uh, it'll tell you who do they owe the money to because we know that because of the accumulated deficit, the easiest way for them to pay that money back is with common shares. So let's see just how many notes are directly payable. Well, loans payable to controlling stockholder, one million, okay? Long-term portion of note payable, $8 million. Notes payable in general, $4.1 million. Okay? So that right there is over $13 million worth of notes payable. Those notes are likely designed using stock. Okay? So the stock today traded 131 million shares at... In at you know just call it triple zero seven so even all of those shares we're still talking about only ninety thousand dollars all in all the stock and we just showed that they have you know what fourteen million dollars in notes payable this stock probably hasn't traded fourteen million dollars worth of stock the entire year so it's probably not anywhere close to the dilution that's still yet to go on okay now, if you just scroll down a little bit, this is all generally in the same spot. They didn't make any money last quarter. Revenue's zero or the year before. Okay, so these notes payable are not going to be able to pay to be paid with any cash because they're not making any. Okay, their loss is actually increasing. Okay, and now here you go. Look at all of this right here. Shares issued for 00715 during the period from debt conversion. 1.66 million shares. Okay? You've got 8 million shares at 0007, 8 million shares at 0005. You know, just all of this, all of this just goes on and on. By March, by March 31st, 2011, it looks like you had 263 million shares issued for debt conversion. So just in general, you know, that's the type of stuff you want to focus on, okay? And this is where you will... Before you buy a stock, if you have time, you know, obviously some of these high-flying momentum promotion type stocks, you don't have time to pull up a, a uh, you know, quarterly report. But if it's a stock that you are planning on buying and holding, okay, for instance, I know that VPIG was a stock that somebody in chat made, made a very good amount of money on, and they bought and held it from like 90 cents all the way up to $2 or so. So let's compare ASYI's quarterly statement in the shares when it comes to the share situation to that of VPIG. We'll just do a quick comparison. 
it's imperative you at least understand the basics. I was terrible in accounting. I failed every class in accounting. I remember, I remember trying to prove myself to the accounting teacher I failed with by retaking the class with her, and I failed it a second time in a row. So, but even still today, I can still look at something like this and understand the basics, okay? So virtual VPIG, look at this. 88 million shares common stock outstanding as of May 15th. Okay, so that's, a, that's good. In my opinion, that's, you know, that's a great sign. Now let's look at the liabilities. Well, first of all, let's look at the common shares. 74 million shares issued most recently. 66, uh, excuse me, 80, what did we say it was? 88 million shares, okay, 74 million shares before that, and then 66 million shares before that. So it is on the rise, but ASYs, I believe, increased from like 133 to 233 to then 500 million. So this is certainly on the rise, but, you know, it's not a gigantic increase. It's a few million shares. Then you look at the accumulated deficit, $8.9 million. Yes, it is $8.9 million, but that's a far ways away from $70 million that we just looked at with ASYI. Now, most importantly, notes payable. They only, have, they only owe $171,000 in notes payable. That is very, very low dilution. And if you compare it to the same period last year, it's actually down year over year from 284,000. Total current liabilities, $856,000. Now, this note payable of $171,000, again, you can see that if you look at the amount of shares issued recently, it doesn't look to be that many at all. There are some warrants here. They did a private placement for 8 million shares at 70 cents. Private placement ending March 31st. Those shares are 504 restricted, so that means they can't sell for six months. So that's April, May, June, July. August, September, you don't need to worry about these 8 million shares, okay? We didn't see anything like that with ASY where they were restricting the shares they were issuing. Now you look at that $171,000 worth, VPIG has traded that amount of money on a regular basis for the entire month, okay? So just a simple comparison points out some of the differences that you need to look for. In general, my rule of thumb, the less outstanding shares, the better. The less notes payable, the better. The less liabilities, the better. Okay? Don't want to see preferred shares. Notice on VPIG, they do have preferred shares authorized, but they have none issued and outstanding. So we don't need to worry about those at the moment. Some of these basics, you have to understand. You have to know what to look for. Last question. Is reading the tape like using the force? How long did it take you to become a Jedi Master? Reading the tape is a lot like, you know, using the force per se, because when I consider reading the tape, I, I'm just assuming this person's referring to watching level two. And level two, again, I, I keep talking about this comes back to that whole concept of watching your friends, uh, excuse me, knowing your friends, okay? The more you know your friends, the more you know how they like to trade, you know? For instance, Priceline. Priceline was a stock that I, I was very attracted to because of the huge momentum it had, right? I mean, it's, it's just been on a tear, but when I first started trading Priceline, I, I started doing it through the options market, I was getting killed, absolutely killed. 
and I hadn't really taken the time to, to watch Priceline at first. I just, I just started trading it right away, just you know, thinking I could rely on my overall experience and skill level as a trader to just start trading a completely new stock. Kind of like when it comes to your friends. You think you can just meet a new person and all of a sudden you're best friends with them. It doesn't work like that. There's a certain amount of time that has to elapse that, you know, and experiences that need to happen in order for you guys to gain that level of trust and understanding of each other's characteristics. So anybody have any guesses as to why I got torn up by Priceline when I first started trading it? as far as the options markets. Yeah, I didn't understand how it moved, but what really killed me on Priceline was the spreads, the spreads in the options markets. I had no, I had never traded options with spreads that were so incredibly wide. And I would just get absolutely killed because I'd buy at the ask and, and the bid would be 50 cents below it. And, you know, I, it took me a while to figure out that you, if you're going to play Priceline options, you have to play them on the bid, okay? In addition, Priceline, as Yeah Buddy points out, it was so volatile that I would go, I would be down on it. I'd cut a loss, and then it would bounce back so, so strongly. I mean, there were times when Priceline options would go down 50%, and then the next, and then later in the day, those same options were up, you know, 300%. So I really had to understand that if I'm going to play Priceline, I better be getting it damn near at the bottom, or else I can't play it, because... And if I am going to play it, I have to be prepared to deal with a 30 to 50% loss just to realize a gain later on. And that wasn't something I was comfortable doing. So, you know, and getting to learn, getting to know Priceline has helped me get to know a similar high-flying stock that has wide spreads that is very volatile as well. Anybody care to guess what stock that is? Yes, Chipotle, CMG. And because of my, you know, because of the time I put in getting to know Priceline, I was able to just move over to Chipotle right away, and it was the same type of person as Priceline was, okay? Now, I know it sounds silly giving these, you know, humanistic values to, or humanistic traits to stocks, but that's, that's how, that's what helps me trade them better. I'm not saying you have to do it, but... You know, if you're asking me when it comes to a question like reading the tape, it's really about getting to know the stock you are trading. Okay? So let's do some charts. IMDC, just a beautiful uptrend here. I like this volume the last two days. Yes, it is low. But relative to the stock's average, it's high. It's above average volume. Highest volume on back-to-back -back days in a month. Okay, let's look even longer term, see what's going on. At a one-year high. Okay, so it's not at two-year highs. This was a stock that fell a long way. Looks like it was promoted here. I mean, this certainly looks like a nice promotion back in 2010 from 80 cents all the way up to $1.50. Oops. Now, a lot of volume in this range right here. The range on this candle was 20 to 30 cents. So that's the range that we're in now. I want to see those levels, though. So the high here was, was 21.5. The high here was 18. High here was 22. So let's see if that 20 to 20, the, that 18 to 22 cent range can now become support. As for resistance, it's this 30 cent level. This is what I'm watching most. If it can break above 30 cents, it could really open up because there's not much volume history other than this channel right here. Okay? 
there's no real volume history above 30 cents from prior years. So above 30 cents is when it could really get interesting. Now what I notice is this stock, when you look at a 60 minute chart, it's, it has random spikes and then kind of dies off the rest of the day. So you just want to be aware of that. If you're buying it for a quick trade, the volume pattern does not suggest that's the, the right approach to take. What the volume pattern suggests is that this is more of a swing trade. Okay, so we've got that key support between 18 and 22 cents that we'd like to see hold. As for resistance, you know, you've got today's high at 24 and then that 30 cent level. I want to see volume continue to increase. If we can get a million share volume day and break 30 cents, this chart would be smoking hot. It would look great. If it's going to pull back to the support level I just talked about, I'd like to see it do so on as little volume as possible, 200 to 500 share, 200 to 500,000 shares or even less. Lululemon need to be aware earnings are coming out Thursday pre-market, so you always have to be aware of a major company event like that. You hate to get caught long or short without knowing that an event like that is coming. So Lulu held above its most recent low from 521. However, this low on 521 was below the low on 424. This low on 424 was below the low on 410. So we have, a, so we have some lower lows recently in place, dating back to April. And you can kind of make a little downward channel line right here. Okay. You have this high, which was an all-time high at $81, but then you had a lower high here at $75.74, and then another lower high here at $74.63. So the key for Lululemon is to break above this high right here at $74. Just, I mean, you might as well just call it $75, okay? Now, we're a long way from $75, and there's good money to be made between here and $75, so let's break it down into the intraday chart and talk about what we need to see. So 71.20 was a level that acted as support around here and then a gap down below it. So we need to clear 71.20. This, this, this range right here, to me, from a risk reward perspective, what might be your trade setup on Lululemon as it approaches or trades into this range. What might be a, a risk reward trade right there? Short bias, okay, any, anybody else? Does anybody agree with pennies, disagree with pennies? Thomas, you're asking questions, but we don't know the answer to those questions until it happens. The key in trading is taking advantage of the better risk-reward scenario or the most likely answer. I agree with pennies that I would have a short bias, okay, because we are approaching resistance. And until resistance is broken above, we need to assume that it is going to hold. Now... Thomas said something very important that is definitely something to take note of, and that's the volume. He said he'd, he'd have a short bias if volume is low. Why would you have a short bias only if volume is low? What's the difference between approaching this range on high volume and approaching this range on low volume? Yes, no demand. If it's low volume, that tells us that there's low demand as we're approaching an area that we expect high supply to exist. Because remember, that's what resistance is. Resistance are levels at which we expect supply to exist. The way to break above levels at which we expect supply to exist is to have greater levels of demand. So that would be my bias. I would have a short bias as you approach this level. Now, we have... The two, we have two solid volume days, 2.36 million, 2.68 million, but 
Those are not much greater than this 2.66 million share day, this 2.25 million day, okay? So what Thomas points out about having a short bias if there's low volume, well, it, it's just pretty much average volume, okay? So with that said, I would still keep a short bias as it broke into that level. Now, if it is able to break above this level on a volume day of, you know, three to four million shares or so, similar to one of these volume days that it put in here in early May, 3.8 million shares, 3. Point, what was this one? So 3.5 million shares. So, so I would agree with that. I, I like everything you guys said. Now, that's the short-term trade. From a longer-term perspective, Lulu is in just an incredible uptrend, okay? Numerous uptrends, as a matter of fact. And it could fall a long ways without negating this uptrend. We're looking at the monthly chart. Now, if we break it down in the weekly chart, again, we see that it could fall theoretically down towards, you know, the $50 to $60 range and still technically be in an uptrend, okay? So let's see how it does around this range. If you want to play it from the long side, what I would like to see is I'd like to see it hold this kind of range right here. The reason is, is because we move down. So the key support is obviously these lows right here, okay? That was the, that's the low at 67.84, which was yesterday's low. So that, you know, that's the key low in terms of keeping that higher low versus the May 21st low in place. But the more important short-term support for this move off of the 67.84 low is this range right here. Now, the reason I chose this range is because after it pulled back to this low here and then bounced, okay, this was then the level it then pulled back from again. So that was my first resistance level. Then you can see once it broke above it, it pulled back again down to here. Uh, it pulled back again to this low. So that's where I'm going to create my channel. I'm going to put the top end of my channel at the first level at which it pulled back from after previously declining. So here's our previous decline from Friday to Monday. Here's the first level at which we pulled back from. And then the second channel I'm going to put it at is then after we break above the first channel, my second support line goes at the level at which it then bounced from again after, previous decline, after previously declining towards it. So here's the breakout above our first channel, and then here's the decline, okay, and then the subsequent bounce. So it's given us this, this range to watch, and that is between... 69.35 and 69.80-ish. The actual high was 69.85 and the actual low was 69.34. Okay, so a nice 50 cent range there to potentially initiate a long position using this 69.34 as a stop loss point because if it breaks 69.34, I would expect a, a retest of these lows here around the 67.90 to 68 range. Below that key support range, I would expect a retest of this low here at 66. Now with earnings coming up, it is important to note on Lulu that it had, it did something interesting here one time, and that's gapping down hard on major, major volume. This was on December 1st. It was the day they reported earnings. It had closed at 50 the day before. The next day opened around $41, but that day it closed at 47. So even if my point is, is that even if Lulu misses earnings and gaps down, say, to 
you know, or even towards 55 on a major earnings miss. Not only is that going to keep the uptrend intact, that's not going to yet negate the uptrend that we just discussed from the longer term perspective. That's also going to represent something the stock has done before and then actually bounced from that level higher. So I'd be careful about leaning in on the short side on a stock like Lulu if it misses earnings and, and trades lower because it has a recent history of you know, shrugging that off while maintaining its overall long-term uptrend. So we've talked about the long side and we've talked about the short side. That $75, if it breaks above this here on strong volume, that $75 level is next, and that's the high that would, that's the level that would really need to be taken out to get the chart, you know, targeting these all-time highs here again. And Lulu, uh, to me, just really quick, it's a good example of my, of how I invest, actually. I like investing in products I buy. Lululemon to me has the most comfortable athletic clothes in the market. And I realized that a few years ago when I first found the store. And as soon as I found out they were public, you know, I, I bought them. And, you know, it, it's really, really helped me. I've been long Lulu in some way, shape, or form since February 2010 when it was around you know $15 a share it did a forward split so I started buying I think my first purchase was, was around $27 so that's an example of you know an investment that worked out because I was familiar with the product so I always recommend investing in in companies that you understand how they make money okay because if it doesn't make sense to you it's not gonna make dollars for you to me, Lululemon, I went in there, I went in the store, I felt the clothes. They were expensive, but I still bought it. And I said to myself, man, these are expensive clothes, but people like me are still willing to buy them. And so, you know, from an investment perspective, it made sense to me because at least if it went down, I would understand why it's going down. I would say, well, I guess there's just not people willing to pay that amount of money for their products, even though they are very high quality. As it's turned out, as evidenced by the chart, there have been people willing to buy their products. Penny's just said an interesting thing about investing in Ulta years ago because his sister shops there a lot. Uh, for any of you men out there, pay attention to where the women in your life shop because it was actually a female in my life that turned me on to Lululemon. It was also a female that turned me on to Michael Kors. It was also a female that turned me on to uh, FNP. Okay, so paying attention to where the women in your life buy their products from can be a uh, helpful indicator when it comes to what you should invest in. Women are very reliable consumers. When they get money, they shop for clothes. When we get money, we probably go buy food or something. Yeah, or beer. Okay, next chart. XRMB. So again, nice longer term uptrend. I don't like this candle today. Really wide range, okay? Kind of a cracking in the range, a lower low. Two lower lows in a, in a row hasn't put in two lower lows in a row in a long time. So it's done something that it hasn't done in a long time. Volume is very low up here. Today's low of 54.4 is very important. Needs to hold that low. If it breaks below 54.4, it could do a retest, you know, of this range here on 48 to 50 prior resistance. Want to see it turn into support. As for resistance, it's these highs here at 67 cents. Above 67 cents, I'd expect a move towards 70. Why don't I expect a, a big move higher right away? Because it doesn't have a history of making a gigantic move even after it puts in new highs. It just seems to be slow and steady, not very volatile, doesn't move up a lot, doesn't move down a lot. Great chart overall, 
but be aware that very low volume relatively. So again, you look at that 60 minute chart, a lot of periods of inactivity. So this is not a stock to trade if you're looking for something active. This is something you should trade if you're looking for more of a swing trade. If you are going to swing trade it, you want to be able to buy it as close to this support level as possible. Today's low and then that low of 48 to 50. AGRT, so big move with the promotion and it's just kind of churning and consolidating. What I don't like is the lower low and lower high. However, relative to the move it made, it's still doing a good job of holding on to the gains. Let's look at the intraday chart to map out a, a, a clearer support level. So a lot of volume, the volume came in and took it from 49 to 56 and then it started at 47.5. So 47.5 to 50 is the support I want to see hold. Below 47.5, I might expect a retest of these lows here at 43 on down to the low here at 38. As for resistance, you've got the afternoon high of 56 cents, and then yesterday's high of 59 cents, and then the all-time high of 62 cents. It's pretty straightforward like to see volume start increasing though. This was the lowest volume update that it's had. So I'd like to see volume increase if it does move higher. GWBU so gave up some of these gains but it was on very very low volume. So to me, that tells me they're just, it wasn't as much about a huge increase in supply at these levels as much as it was a lack of demand. So, you know, low volume pullback, low supply pullback on a net net basis, that's a positive to me because it means it will only take a little bit of an increase in demand to get it back up towards these highs. Today's high 176 is going to be our resistance that needs to break. Yesterday's open of 187, okay, well, no, I'm sorry. So today's high 176, Friday's close of 182, yesterday's high 187, Friday's high 191, and then $2 for obvious reasons. As far as support, this 160 range acted as resistance, and we're, we're seeing it become support, which is good. That 155 to 160 range that it struggled with, acted as support today so that's a great sign in my opinion so let's just see it put in a higher low no reason it should go below 155 regardless of the supply and demand situation if it does go below 155 I would expect further downside and that would set the chart back a ways so let's hold 155 ideally it doesn't even go back below 160 okay and then on the breakout of 176 you know we talked about the levels people are going to be targeting from a broader perspective, while you may be getting frustrated by how long GWBU is taking the play out, there's nothing to me that suggests this is over. Not yet, at least. We don't have a, a big volume dump day. We haven't had that yet. Google is an interesting one because even though it is down a lot, from this, from its high for the year at what was, what, 670? It's down 15%. If you look at a monthly chart of Google, it's essentially where it was at this time a year ago. You know, I mean, Google, we've talked about it on many occasions. Google just hasn't done anything really for a long time, for the last two, three years. It's just been channeling. What I like is the channel keeps getting higher, okay? Now, what's important, though, is right here, today's low of 566.47. You've got two key lows, okay? That's this low at 561.33 and this low here at 564.55. These are the real, real key lows. To me, if Google breaks below that range, it's going to pull back towards 540. That's where you had some price congestion from you know,
in this range here, again, this is a monthly chart. So if that low at what is 561.33 doesn't hold, you know, I, I expect to move towards 540. Now, the unique situation with Google then, of course, is we are very, very close to that key low. So that means we have a good risk reward scenario because we can initiate a long trade with using this level 561.33 as a stop loss. Now with that said, that is from a price perspective. We're looking at a one year weekly chart. And now let's look at a daily chart of the last 100 days. Is there anything you guys see on the volume side of things that might be more relevant than the risk reward scenario that the price is currently presenting. I'll show it again. This is the weekly of the last two years. Let's just focus on the one year. This is the weekly of the last year. This is the daily of the last 100 days. Any thoughts on that volume that we see? Yeah, just overall the volume pattern seems very bearish to me. When it moves down, it does so on very high supply. When it moves up, it does so on very little demand and it fails to break above these previous levels. So the price has lower highs in place. Most recently it has lower lows as well. Like I said, on increasing supply. Uh, if you just look since this week here of the last week in March, you've had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight negative weeks out of 10. I don't see any streak like that in Google over the last year. The last time that happened was one, two, three, four, five. Five, six, seven, no, that was seven out of ten. In the last two years. One, two, three, four. I don't see it in the last three years. I, I don't see a weekly streak as bad as this for Google in terms of down weeks, you know, eight weeks out of ten lower. excuse me, in, in the stock in at least the last four or five years. Okay, so that, that's bearish to me. I mean, that's, you know, might be trying to tell me something. And again, on the daily chart, just a poor volume pattern overall. Now, with that said, it's only down 15% off of its high versus this time here when it's high was was you know 715 and it it pulled back all the way down to 247 or here in 2010 when the high was 630 and it pulled back all the way down to 430 or here when the high was 642 and it pulled back down to 473 so while the weekly pattern is bearish the overall price decline isn't as drastic as previous declines. So, you know, you kind of got a, a, a tug and a pull here in both directions, an argument to be made in both cases. And, you know, you don't know which one is right. And that's why all we can do is just take advantage of the risk reward scenario that the price is presenting against this low this 561.33 and 564.55 lows. Now let's break it down into more of the intraday perspective for the day traders because we just talked about the longer term situation. So what I notice is gap down, tried to get up and got rejected at around yesterday's close. Then you had a nice little uptrend here into the close. Tomorrow that 
at the opening bell, that uptrend is going to be right around 570. <coughs> okay. Now, needs to clear that 572 level. That was recent highs. You've also just got kind of a overall downtrend here the last day and a half. That downtrend line is going to be between 572 and 574. So we need to break 572 first. Now on the 15 minute chart, what I don't like also is you had really strong volume the first 15 minutes of the day on some of these days here on what was Tuesday May 29th and Monday June 4th but it all went for naught it just gave up those gains now also if you look you definitely have a downtrend here okay so this is really the more important downtrend. Tomorrow that's going to be around 576 to 582 depending on what time of the day. Earlier in the day at the open that line is right around 580. By the end of the day it'll have come down to 576-ish or so. So really need to break convincingly above this downtrend line. If you look, you know, just from a broader perspective So we broke out of this first one, but now we're dealing with this second one that I just talked about. So those are some of the things on Google that I that I notice. And the reason that that that's hard to deal with, what I pointed out about the high volume in the first 15 minutes, is one of the key indicators I look for when going long is very strong volume in the first 15 minutes as the price is increasing. Now the problem with that with Google is we had that on a day like Monday and yet it gave up those gains. So if, if you got the volume signal, it kind of didn't matter. Now there is something important about this 15 minute bar right here that could have hinted at it and it's a reason why I personally tend to wait until I see the first 15 minutes before initiating my trade. Do you guys, any, any thoughts on what is noticeable to me about this, even on the strong volume. Right, sell off at the high, closed well off the highs. I mean, if you think about penny stocks and what we look for when determining a gapper, we want to see the stock closing on highs. Well, Google gave up all of its gains from this opening candle. At one point, it went from 570 all the way up to 580, but by it was all by the time it was all said and done, it had given up five dollars and closed in the midpoint of that range. Okay, and actually, if you use if you use the approach, if you use Google's approach towards this high as a short signal, it actually worked out to be a very nice trade. So I want to see strong volume at the first 15 minutes, and I want to see it closing near the top of that candle. Okay guys, unfortunately I'll have to get to the rest of the charts later. I have a commitment coming up in 20 minutes that I have to get to. So hope everybody got something out of that. And again, I will post the rest of the charts later. I can finish up. And the video will be posted later tonight. ICPA very nice breakout today however volume was kind of lacking so it was good solid volume of 8 million shares the highest volume that it's traded on an up day since May 9th however relative to this move that it made here in late April through early May it's much lower volume and the problem with that is this volume that traded here remember is likely to come out at some point. From a price perspective though, what is the key is that it broke above 
this four cent range, which had been knocking it down over the last month. Furthermore, it also broke above the next most recent high, which was at 4.4, and now you have resistance at today's high of 5 cents, and above 5 cents, you have resistance at this high of 5.85. As far as support, you want to see prior resistance become support. So really the four, four cent to four, four range, I'd like to see that become support. As for volume, I'd really prefer to see a nice high volume update again tomorrow of at least 10 million shares or so. As far as volume at the open, that might signal a day like that is coming. Well, within the first 15 minutes today, well, let's go to the first five minutes, within the first five minutes actually that's not a good indication so 30 minutes you can see that in the first 30 minutes today I traded 2 million shares that was greater than the first 30 minutes on Monday when it traded 1.5 million shares so let's be on pace for greater than 2 million shares within the first 30 minutes tomorrow so in other words if it trades a million shares in the first five minutes that'd be a great sign from an intraday perspective, the volume is pretty consistent, more or less, some patches of inactivity, but for a stock this uh, for a stock price this low, the volume is pretty solid. Now immediate support is going to be right here at 463 or 458. You can see that was the afternoon low. So that would be your immediate support above that 4 to 44 range that we talked about and we need to crack above that five cent range to really get going. RARS, you know, just had this big move where they faked everybody out with that scam of a promotion, whatever it was. So there's obviously a lot of bag holders in this stock now. So that's gonna hurt it as it tries to make any bounce attempts like it did yesterday in its attempt to bounce, hit a high of 12 cents, but ended up closing back at nine. And then today, again, hit a high of 10.5, but closed at 8.75. We do have a higher low versus yesterday, so let's just put in a higher low versus tomorrow. So I'd like to see it stay above 8.5. And let's, if it can solidify itself above 10, then we could have a, a much better bounce play as it attempts to move towards the 15 to 20 cent range. But until we see some solidification above 10 cents, I'm just not very fond of the risk reward scenario on a stock like RARS. ASY, highly diluted piece of shit stock, triple zero, nothing to talk about. We talked about how much dilution there is on this stock earlier in the session, so I just really would stay away from this one at all costs. AMRS, nice day today but it's coming in the midst of a much longer term downtrend that really hasn't broken. However, highest volume on an update today in over a year, highest volume on an update today since its existence, it seems like. Now, let's look at the intraday chart to get the best perspective. So here's your key low at 288. Key low at 288, okay? Let's break above that $3 level. If it can do that, we can target this 320 and then today's high at 338. But below 288, I would expect a test of these lows here on 275. And then below that, you have this low here at 255. So 288 is really going to be the key level. Let's see if in the first five minutes of trading, if the price is increasing and it trades more than 90,000 to 120,000 shares, that would be a nice setup for a bullish day in my opinion. 